Hi guys, welcome back to another hosting vlog. So if you're new here, I'm Aisha. I love to bake, I love to cook, and I especially love to host fancy dinners. Like I will never miss an opportunity to host the people I love. And today we are hosting something super special. So I have this anniversary tradition where I host a special fancy date night for my husband at home. And it's our three year wedding anniversary. So I'm continuing that tradition and I'm doing one more date night today. And I'm super excited for it. This is like, I think probably my favorite thing to host uh, it's just so special and my husband really enjoys the food that I make so it makes it extra special. I shared my date night vlog from last year as well so if you want to check that out I'm going to put that in the description. So the idea of these date nights is that I do a date night at home but I try to make it fancy. I create a multiple course menu. I do the usual appetizer main course and dessert but whenever I'm hosting whether it's for a big group of guests or for a single person or for two people I also like to have a little starter at the very beginning while I'm finishing up everything in the kitchen all the courses are just about ready people are on the table or waiting on the sofa i don't like them to just wait so i create like a simple starter like a bread basket or a charcuterie boat or something like that so last time in my menu i had made a focaccia so if you want to have a look at how i made it you can check that out but that's the idea that i like to do so let's get into today's menu before i share the menu with you i want to share a tip so one thing that i always always do before deciding on a menu for any party small big anything is i pick a theme so the theme is usually surrounding a cuisine or a style of food or something like that it's mostly around cuisine this i think is really really helpful and really important for you to do whenever you're planning a menu for a party because it like number one it just helps you create the menu more easily because okay you know this is the cuisine that you want to pick from so you know okay this I'm, I, I have these ideas for appetizers these ideas for main courses and so on you're not like all over the place that oh should I make a pasta for main course and a butter chicken for appetizer like you know you don't want that and secondly I think that having a theme in a menu is really important because it gives your menu a little bit of cohesiveness you know it puts it all together so when you eat one thing after the other it just all makes sense and it just goes together the eating experience is a lot better when the flavors are all similar and that's what you experience in restaurants right like you have a specific cuisine if you're going for Indian food you're eating like Indian flavors packed in different ways yes but the flavors are similar and that really adds to the eating experience so I highly highly recommend that whenever you're hosting a party at least have a rough theme it doesn't have to be really strict like something that basically revolves around the same flavor profile so that's one tip I highly, highly recommend doing before you host. So with that, let's get to today's menu. So today's theme I've decided on is a Palestinian Arabic menu. So I've basically been inspired by this book. This is the book Zetun. Uh, by Yasmin Khan. Uh, one of my friends gifted me this book and it's a Palestinian cookbook and it's a wonderful cookbook and I've used this before as well um, in my first cookbook club. I'll link the video to that below but it's a wonderful book and I really love the flavors uh, of the Palestinian cuisine. They're very similar to Arabic cuisine which is something that I've grown up eating so I really enjoy them and also I just think it's so important for us right now to champion the Palestinian culture and to just like you know make sure that we educate ourselves about it we learn more about it because this is the time to preserve this culture no matter what this culture stays alive in all of us and I think that's so 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 important and it's very important for me and the recipes are absolutely wonderful and this cookbook is so great like I'm gonna try to show you so it's basically like distributed according to uh, regions so here for example we have Gaza and we have like stories so Yasmin has shared stories she's been there herself so these are wonderful stories wonderful recipes so I'm very very excited to cook after out of this again and three out of my four recipes are from this and I'll take you along all of them starting with the starter which is just going to be on the table while everything else is being prepared i've decided to make hummus and arabic bread both of these recipes are from the book and both of them are going to be made from scratch i'm going to try my best because i've not make made hummus or arabic bread from scratch but 
I really want to learn these things, so what better time to give this a try? That's going to be the starter for the table. Then the next thing that's the appetizer is going to be batata hara, which is basically a roasted potato dish. It has a lot of spices, parsley, and so on. It's really delicious. It's really refreshing. I don't know if it's a very Palestinian dish. It is in the book, but I think it also has Lebanese roots. So, but you know, it's just a Levant region. There's so many overlaps of like dishes, flavors, and so on. That's a dish that I really enjoy eating myself whenever I go to restaurants. So I wanted to recreate that. And the third one, which is the dessert. Sorry, I missed the main course. The third one, which is the main course, I'm going to go for masakhan, which I think is one of the most popular Palestinian dish. I'm sure you guys probably have come across a recipe in the last one year, and it's basically chicken thighs marinated with a lot of spices, a lot of sumac and red onions. It's a simple recipe, but I've eaten it before and it's so delicious, so I really want to, to give it a try myself. And then the final course is uh, the dessert. I wanted to make something like a cake so that it could be a celebration but it's just the two of us i don't want to make anything big because it just it's so much wastage i don't like that so i'm gonna make a really small cheesecake and this cheesecake is again similar flavors it's a yogurt and honey cheesecake it also has like hints of honey and thyme and i love those flavors together so i'm very excited to try it that recipe is actually from this book Ottolenghi simple it's one of my favorite cookbooks it has very similar flavors so i'm very excited to try this one as well but it's going to be a tiny one just for the two of us so that we don't waste any and that's going to be the menu for today and now i really need to get started because i'm so short on time and i'm already late already behind so i have to get started i couldn't do any prep beforehand because my husband was at home so i basically have to do everything today but it's okay we will make it happen let's get started and the first things first i have to wear my apron because if you've seen my other videos i am messy okay aprons on so let's get started the first thing i have to make is the cheesecake because it has to set honestly it should set overnight it's a no bake cheesecake it should set overnight but no time uh, but since it's a small one i think it's going to be okay i'm just going to set it it's going to have four to five or at least six hours i think to set so i think it should be fine let's hope okay so here's what the cheesecake is supposed to look like i'm going to make it in my super tiny smartphone pan which is this like this is enough for the both of us so a very small quantity and the ingredients are pretty simple. So first we have Greek yogurt, but this has to be strained so that it thickens. You remove all the water from it. You basically put it in like a mesh towel or a mesh cloth, like a cheese cloth, and you squeeze out all the water and it just becomes nice and thick. So this will, this will help the consistency. Then we have cream cheese, of course, it's a cheesecake. Then we have white chocolate, lemon zest, butter, and digestive biscuits for the crust. And I think that's pretty much it. So let's get started. The first thing I started with was the crust for the cheesecake. It's super simple to make. All you do is crush your digestive biscuits into a fine powder like this, then transfer them in a bowl and mix with melted butter and salt until it reaches the consistency of wet sand. You can also add a little thyme into the crust for extra flavor. I have this very handy tip for lining your spin foam pads because I've always struggled with that. So basically what I do is I take a square piece of baking paper or caution paper that's just slightly bigger than the bottom of the spring foam pan. So here's the bottom, here's the paper basically, that's the size, right? And I take the bottom, I flip it, I place the caution paper on top of it and then I take the ring of the spring foam pan this far and place it right on top of the paper, so like this. And then I close it. Wait. So what this does is this basically just locks the paper in and it's lined at the bottom. If you can see very properly, this will also make sure there's no spillage. So I really love doing it this way for the bottom. Now for the sides, what I basically do is I take two pieces of washing paper, like two strips basically. The height should be at least as big as the size of the spring foam pan or slightly taller. So here you can see it is slightly taller like this. Now I take a piece of butter and just basically grease the sides. Just very rough greasing. Put the parchment paper and just 
stick them to the pan. So the butter basically helps the parchment paper or the baking paper stick to the pan, something like this. And once you do that, your entire spring foam pan will be lined perfectly. And this just makes the removal process so much easier because once I open the tin, like you know, once the cheesecake is set, I open it, then I just remove the parchment from the side. It will make sure the cheesecake comes out nice and safe. Now that the pan is lined, I'm just going to press the crust down into it. Once the crust was ready, I let it chill in the fridge while I prepared the cheesecake. For the cheesecake, add the cream cheese, yogurt, icing sugar and lemon zest and whisk until everything is well combined and you have a smooth mixture. Then add the melted white chocolate and whisk again until it's fully combined. The batter should not have any lumps. Okay, this is done, so I'm gonna give it a taste test. I'm very interested to know what these flavors taste like. It's like just barely sweet. It has so much flavor from like the lemon zest and the yogurt. And I'm sure once you put the honey on top, it's gonna be absolutely delicious. Place the cheesecake batter on top of the crust, smooth it out evenly, then let it chill in the fridge for oh, at least two so to three creamy. hours, or ideally for at least six hours if you have the time. Okay, now we're going to move on to the chicken because it has to be marinated, so I gotta work really quickly. So this is what masakhan looks like. So it's basically roast chicken with sumac and red onions. So we have to marinate the chicken thigh skin on with olive oil, cumin, allspice, cinnamon, sumac, some lemon, some garlic, and also onions. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just slice up the onions. So I've got two red onions. It's necessary that you use red onions for musakhan. They cannot be white, they should be red. And we're just gonna slice them thinly. For slicing the onions easily, cut the edges first so that you have a flat surface, then slice them from the center. This will make it easier to peel them as well. Now make what we call the claw with your fingers like this. Keep the end of your fingertips flat so that the knife can move against the flat surface. This reduces the chances of you cutting yourself and gives you more control on the knife. And remember, it's not about speed, it's about precision. So go slowly, but use the right technique to slice your onions. Remember to use this babe-like motion to slice your veggies, especially if your knife isn't very sharp. Once I reach the end of the onion, I flatten it like this and slice again to avoid any injuries. Classic onion. Before we begin, I wanted to give you two very important tips that you should keep in mind when you're hosting something. It's going to make a huge difference. First, always clean as you go. So if you look at my bench here, I clean it after every step so that there's no mess around all the time. Second is that prepare your ingredients before you get started. So this is basically in technical terms is called called mise en place. It's a French term. It basically means everything in its place. I think that's a rough translation. But it basically just means that take out all your ingredients, keep them in one side. This just makes the process so much easier. Like I cannot explain how much doing this changes my process. And when I don't do this, it's a mess. Like seriously, it's a big fat mess when I don't do this. So I highly recommend that you stick to doing these things and you'll see the difference throughout your day, especially when you're hosting. You should do it in your everyday life as well, but especially when you're hosting do this so for this recipe you're supposed to use chicken thighs so here are my thigh skin on i've cleaned them well and i've pad dried them with the tissue so that they're completely dry then i'm just going to create a couple of slits please do this on a cutting board i don't know why i'm doing it like this but you get the point i've created the slits and this is just going to make sure that the marination goes inside well and flavors the entire chicken Place all the chicken in a bowl, then add the olive oil generously. Next, we're going to add the spices, starting from cumin powder, allspice, use garam masala if you can't find allspice, and sumac. Then add the lemon juice, minced garlic, salt, and pepper, and mix the chicken. Then add the onions and mix again until both the chicken and onions are well coated with the marinade. Now I'm going to marinate this for two to three hours, the longer the better. And while this marinades, I'm going to make the hummus. Okay, so the hummus. I've never made hummus before, but one thing I knew from before, I've heard hundreds of people say it, is that don't use canned chickpeas. Use dry ones and leave them in water overnight. Let them soak, let them double in size. And apparently it's a crime if you use 
tinned or canned chickpeas. So we were doing it the traditional way. So uh, these were dry chickpeas. I just let them soak in the water overnight and they're nice and fluffy. Now we have to boil them in water until they are kind of soft, but not super mushy. So around like halfway through and we basically cook them with bicarb soda. To make the hummus, add the soaked chickpeas into a saucepan with water and baking soda. Cook them on high heat until they start boiling and keep removing the white foam on top as it forms. Continue to cook them for 30 to 40 minutes until they're soft but not too soft. So now that the chickpeas are soft and drained, we can make the hummus. I've brought out my big gun, my proper mixer because I really want it to be super creamy. So let's do it. Now into the mixture, add the drained chickpeas while they're still hot. This just makes the blending process a lot easier. Now add the garlic, lemon juice, tahini, cumin powder and salt and blend until the hummus is almost halfway blended through. It still needs a little more mixing but I just want to taste test it and see if it needs more salt or seasoning. Good, but needs more salt for sure. Maybe a little bit more lemon as well. This is why it's super super necessary to keep tasting your food as you're cooking it because I can tell that the salt is really less now and I can change that, I can add more salt, I can add more lemon. You can't do it at the end, so just save yourself that problem and taste test your food as you go. Season it as per your taste, then add the ice cubes and blend again until the hummus is smooth. The ice cubes help in making the hummus extra smooth and creamy, so I recommend not skipping them. Transfer the hummus into a box and set it aside until you're ready to serve. Guys, I'm so behind. I cannot even express how behind I am. So we got to work really quickly. So bad time management, clearly. Um, but the next thing we have to do is the Arabic flatbreads. Like I want to make the dough because it needs to rest for an hour. So I'm going to start making the dough. And while it needs, I'm going to set up the table because that's something I want to do before my husband comes. All the finishing of the food, like cooking the chicken or cooking the potatoes, which I still have to boil, um, has to be done while he's here because I want it to be nice and hot. So I'll keep all the prep ready, but I'll start cooking once he's here already. So the only thing that we need to do before he comes is make the Arabic bread dough, set up the table, set up the house and get ready. I think we can do it. So for the bread, it's basically like sort of like pita bread. We need bread flour, yeast, sugar, salt, water and oil. We basically just knead the dough in the mixer until it's nice and fluffy and then we dress it and then we make the breads. Let's go. For the Arabic bread, add the bread flour, yeast, sugar, salt, half of your water and olive oil into your mixer bowl and knead until it forms a rough dough. You can also make this dough with your hands if you don't have a mixer. Now add the remaining water a little at a time and knead the dough until it's smooth and not tacky. This might take a little longer if you're kneading by hand, but it should form very easily. If you see, the dough is really soft and really put together. I'm just going to do the window pane test uh, to check if it's done. So window pane test is a super simple thing. You just pull apart of the dough a little bit just to see if you can stretch it without breaking it. That means that there's enough gluten formation in your dough and it's ready to go. So basically what you do is you hold the dough, pick a piece from the dough using your fingers and start stretching it out, something like this. Keep stretching it. If you can see, I've stretched it quite a lot without it breaking, which means it has passed the window pane test. It did break a tiny bit, but that's okay. We don't need a super, super tight dough. So this is ready to go. Now I'm going to oil it, put it in a bowl, let it rise for one hour. Cover a bowl with a little olive oil, then place the dough in it and roll it around to cover it with the oil. This will stop it from sticking to the bowl or drying out. Cover and let it rest for about an hour. Now let's set the table. I like to pick a color theme based on the things I have so the table looks well coordinated. Here I picked blue and neutral so I started with the neutral tablecloth then added a blue runner. Then I used my favorite blue plates. I will link them in the description for you. I also created a menu. I love doing this because it's super simple to do. You can find hundreds of 
Swift templates on Canva and print them out, but it makes the setup look a lot fancier. I had to use my favorite glasses that I got from London. I'm literally obsessed. And I also like to add a few candles and other tidbits on the table to make it look nicer. I also decided to serve all the food in one go instead of bringing out each course separately, just so that I could relax and enjoy the meal with my husband. So I decided on the server and placed it on the table and the table was ready. I like to set up the table beforehand whenever I host because it looks nice and pretty when the guests come and you don't have a bare table and it also makes it easier for you at the end because you're not running around getting your server. Once that was done, I got ready and I moved back to my bread dough which had doubled in size. I punched out all the air from the dough, then I placed it on the counter which was well floured so that the dough does not stick to it. Then I sliced it into 6 equal pieces. Try to keep them as even as possible for even sized breads but don't worry too much about it, they don't have to be perfect. Now shape each piece into a smooth dough ball like this. Make sure to push it down between your hands. That's what makes it smooth. Honestly, I was feeling like such an Indian cereal housewife doing this in a sari. It was so funny. Now flatten the dough balls and roll them out. This dough was pretty easy to roll. Just make sure to flour your surface and the rolling pin and roll it out in an oval shape. It's a little resistant, so make sure to put some power into the rolling. Don't roll them out too thin. The dough should have a little thickness to it like this. My supervisor was watching over me the whole time, making sure I'm doing it all right. Now cover and rest the dough for 15 more minutes and meanwhile place a flour baking tray into your oven and preheat at the highest setting. Then place each piece of the preheated baking sheet in the oven for 2-3 to three minutes. I really want to capture this, my oven is so dirty but the way these are just becoming fluffy is so cool. Wow, these are gorgeous. The color, like there's color from the other side. I think this is actually too much color, but you get the idea. Okay, now I had to rush and prepare the batata harra. It was super simple. I boiled chopped potatoes with salt for about 5 minutes and placed them in a preheated pan with olive oil. Then I topped them with chili flakes, minced garlic, salt, pepper and paprika powder. Gave them a quick mix and placed the tray back in the oven for about 30 minutes until they were golden brown and crispy. Then I topped them with a generous squeeze of lemon juice and chopped parsley. Gave them a good mix and they were ready to go. Finally, I put the chicken in the air fryer with all the juices, onions and everything and I baked it for about 25 minutes at 170 degrees until it was well cooked and the skin was crispy. Next, I went ahead and fried some pine nuts and olive oil to use as topping for the hummus and the masakhan. I think these add so much flavor and texture and I definitely recommend you do not skip them. Then I made the mocktail which was basically pomegranate and orange juice with soda. I mixed the pomegranate juice with some sumac and salt. Sumac is quite a fruity and tart spice so it complemented the flavors really well. I always like to create a rim of sugar and salt on my glasses when serving a mocktail because it makes the drink so much better, especially the salt. If you've never tried it, you must just run a lemon on the edges of the glass to wet it then cover it with a sugar and salt mixture like this i added the pomegranate juice first then i topped it with orange juice and soda i kind of wanted it to look like a sunset but the colors just mixed together but it was okay because it still tasted delicious then it was finally time to finish all the dishes and serve starting with the hummus i topped it with some garlic olive oil some pine nuts and a little bit of paprika then i added the batata hara into a bowl and topped it with some chopped parsley and a little bit more lemon for the masakhan, I placed two of the breads at the bottom of the plate. Then I topped them with the chicken pieces and the onions. Make sure to add all the juices on top as well. I forgot to add the pine nuts and the sumac at the top here, but I added them later. Then finally, I placed the breads in the bread basket and we were ready to go. And here was the table all set and I must say everything turned out amazing. I absolutely love this cookbook. Every recipe is just bang on, especially the hummus and the bread because I made it for the first time. It was so easy. It turned out absolutely amazing. And I think, I think my husband really enjoyed it as well. 
When it was time for dessert, I removed the cheesecake from the pan and look how easily it comes out. No sticking or any other issues and thankfully it set right in time. It was a little rough around the edges so I smoothed it out using a hot offset spatula. Then I topped it with a warm honey and thyme mixture. This is what made this cheesecake. The combination of flavors was absolutely amazing. And that was our cute little anniversary date night. I really can't believe it's been three years and I hope to keep doing this as long as I can. I hope you enjoyed cooking along with me as much as I did. And I hope to see you again here mm. soon. Great. So don't forget to like, subscribe and let me know in the comments what you enjoyed. See you next time.